Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Anna Kate and today I have on a special guest, a friend of mine who has an awesome conversion story. He was an atheist actor and an extra in the Hollywood world and has seen so many things that goes on in Hollywood and he's seen the dark side of it obviously and he got radically saved and has been used in a mighty way in the hollywood scene as a christian he's also been a pastor the past 10 years but before we get him on and hear about his testimony i want to say a quick thank you to the sponsor of this show noble gold are you frustrated with this new administration like so many of us are where we're seeing gas prices going up maybe your retirement fund is dwindling you're losing money and you're looking for a new approach well noble gold is a great place to start if you're looking for an ira or a 401k precious metals is the way to go renewables need solar panels electric circuits and lots of other gizmos that use you guessed it silver with a projected two trillion dollar investment there's never been a better time to profit from the future with your silver ira and this month noble gold is gifting a rare genuine carson city minted morgan silver dollar with every qualifying ira or 401k so head on over to noble gold and talk to an expert at noblegoldinvestments.com or you can also call noble gold today at 877-646-5347 Todd, thank you so much for joining us. You have such an incredible testimony. You went from Hollywood atheist actor to radically on fire for Jesus turned pastor. <laughs> I mean, it's so incredible. I mean, I was, I was an atheist as well. And so I love meeting people who are radically on fire for Jesus, who used to be atheists. Tell us about your testimony. It's a huge blessing to be on your show. And I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing out there. And you know, God is using you in a major way. So really appreciate it. I'm just honored to be here. But yeah, I mean, my testimony is something that, you know, for years, I honestly didn't want to share it because it's very personal. As you know, testimonies are personal. And I went through a lot of different things as we all have in our life. And I'm out, I'm now actually writing a book on my testimony because I feel like it's time to do this. But uh, I did. I was an atheist. I my mom, you know, was a stage mom, and so for most actors and actresses uh, that are in Hollywood, you know, there's a stage mom or somebody that takes them to the set every day, and that was me. My mom would take me. Uh, we moved from the Midwest out to California, and so from a young age, I was an actor out there, and uh, you know, witnessed a lot of different things. Anna, I mean, I saw. Uh, you know, I was working with actresses like Alyssa Milano. I was working on Who's the Boss uh, as an, you know, an extra. I was working on a lot of shows as a regular extra. General Hospital, Jake and the Fat Man. Um, let me see what else. 30-something, uh, uh, a bunch of national commercials, different things. And the money was great, but I was a kid, so I didn't even really care about the money. It was an interesting experience for me. And uh, I'm out there as, like you said, an atheist, so I didn't have the Lord. And I was witnessing things that were, uh, you know, I guess you would call it discernment as a Christian, but this is pre-Christian. So there were things going on on these sets that, you know, I could tell it was dark and I didn't really know what it was, but as a child, I could just, I got like this eerie feeling or this weird feeling, you know, as I was on some of these sets. And so this began to open my eyes to kind of dig deeper. Uh, but, you know, I saw things like, you know, there, there's people talk about the casting couch, you know, it didn't happen to me. I really believe like God protected me but I saw, you know, some of the female actresses that I was working with, you know, I would see they're young, they were super young, like teenagers, and there would be creepy people that would, you know, be, um, you know, saying inappropriate things to them, kind of, um, you know, sexualized comments. And I would observe this as a young man. And I was like, this isn't right, you know? And so these things and many other things started awakening me to what I say, what really led me to Christ in the end, but you know, it was the demonic realm. I could see that there were things going on in Hollywood. And so it just, it opened a can of worms in my life to, to become a truth seeker. Yeah. And so, so you saw this demonic activity with your own eyes. For me, I remember reading it online and thinking, this is interesting. There are Satanists out there. That means yeah. that they're actually worshiping something. And if, if Satan is real, that means God is real. And I had the fear of the Lord and I thought to myself, if God is real, I want to know him because that means that heaven and hell is real and I don't want to go to hell. Yeah. And so I read it online. I felt like it was the truth, but you actually saw it. So you saw a really dark demonic activity in Hollywood. But what was your moment where you said, oh snap, Jesus <laughs> is real. Forgive me of my sins. I want to go to heaven. I want to know you. 
Well, so it's all a journey because God's the good shepherd. And I really believe he, you know, he chases after us. He, you know, he loves us. Like they said, he leaves the 99 to go after the one. Well, I was the one, you know, and uh, I came from a family. I love my family. They've now come to know the Lord. But when I was a child, there was abuse in the home. There was uh, my parents constantly fought. And so it was a, a really difficult situation for me as a child. So I started to rebel. And being in Hollywood and having the spirit of rebellion, that's not a good mix, okay? And so what would happen was I would make friends with, you know, the other people in Hollywood. I had some Disney stars that were friends. I had, you know, certain people that I even dated that were, you know, Disney people. And so I got to see what I call the Disney machine. I got to see a lot of these things firsthand. I, and what I noticed is, is there was a lot of control in these people's lives. There were people that I call handlers, and they literally would control like every aspect of their life. So from the morning, you know, from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night, a lot of their day was pretty much pre-planned and these handlers would kind of set it all up. Now, I wasn't quite at that level as an actor, but I did have, you know, people that were kind of telling me where I needed to be and what I needed to do and what I needed to say. But some of my friends, I would notice their entire life was like completely controlled. And that was really shocking to me because, you know, I'm just thinking like, what is going on here? You know, and there well, was a couple you would, of times you, you would expect you have a lot of money, you can do whatever you want and you you get on any show you want and, and you live your life. But they are so controlled, like with Demi Lovato was talking about publicly her battles with drugs yeah. mostly and how she's super controlled. And I, I was shocking to find out how controlled they are when they're that famous. They're really handled. That's exactly right. And it's been my experience over and over from different celebrities that I saw that this was the case. And in fact, I mean, just to be honest, a couple of times, some of my friends tried to break out and, and get out of Hollywood and get out of being controlled and handled. And I also saw what happened when they tried to do that. Uh, the industry can be very, um, you know, brutal. <laughs> and so if you try to break away from your handlers and your, I mean, they'll drop you. Uh, one of my friends became a Christian and she didn't want to do a lot of the stuff that they were sending her. They were sending her on all types of, uh, you know, auditions that were, you know, basically half naked or fully naked. I mean, it was crazy. And, you know, she became a Christian and she's like, I don't want to do these things. And so the agency, which was one of the top three agencies in Hollywood actually dropped her. So she went from getting like a list. Uh, you know, roles to getting nothing and having a hard time even finding rep representation. And this is so crazy. It was so eye opening to me. Like, why does she have to do this in order to get parts? You know, and this this was wow. repeated over and over again with different friends of mine. It didn't happen as much with me because I'm a man. But, you know, there were roles that they wanted me to play that I didn't want to do, you know. And so but at the time, again, I wasn't really serving the Lord, so it wasn't a big deal to me. But I was seeing these different things happening to people I knew. And we would go you know, to a Bible study here and there. There'd be some cool pastor maybe that would be putting together some type of Hollywood Bible study. We'd pop in. You know, it was kind of like a social thing. Uh, but the Bible says that the word of God does not return back void. And so what would happen is we would hear truth and it would become, so I kind of got into like a quasi kind of half Christian, half not, you know, this weird uh, where I kind of believed in God, but I didn't really live for him for a season. And that, that was kind of the beginning of my journey. You know what I'm saying? That's amazing. See those seeds, you know, the, the word says the Lord's word never comes back void. So as soon as you fling, someone flings those seeds, those words of God, they pierce your soul. It yes. says they pierce and they separate your spirit and your soul. They pierce. It's a double-edged sword. And that's so awesome. So you were going to these Bible studies and you started thinking God might be real. And, and so you, the mix of that and seeing the evil, you, was that the moment where you thought, wait a second, I do see a big difference between good and evil. This must be spiritual, not just in the physical. Yes. Well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to share something with your audience that I haven't really shared publicly, you know, and, and I used to have an addiction problem. So we, you know, my friends and my, and we, we would party, you know, the people that I hung out with, and this was kind of like part of the world of being in Hollywood. You know, there was a lot of drinking, you know, sometimes there were some other, you know, they would call them party favors, you know, what I'm talking about that would be there. And so a lot of the actors and actresses that I hung out with in young Hollywood were addicted also at a young age. And I think this is part of the demonic deception uh, that happens to people in Hollywood. We see it. You mentioned Demi Lovato. I know that crowd personally. I mean, I know many of the people that hung around that crowd. And yes, many of them struggled with addiction. And I think it's a way because if you don't have God, you're looking for an out. You're looking for an escape. You're looking for a void. 
And so that's a momentary, a temporary void filler. But what happens is you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I feel awful. You know, you're, you're hurting your body. The Bible says the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're literally hurting your body and defiling your body. But in the world, that is very accepted. And that's what a lot of people do to kind of conceal. I, I mentioned that I had some brokenness as a child from my family. You know, we would try to conceal our brokenness and the many things that were going on in our life by, you know, partying and drinking. And, and that was our escape, Anna. And so in those times, you know, I remember being at a Hollywood party. This was really weird, actually. Um, it was a it was at a club. And I'd never been to this place. There's so many like weird places in Hollywood that, you know, you just all of a sudden you're in this new building. No idea where I was, but it was somewhere off like uh, Sunset Boulevard. And anyway, I walked in and there was a, a there was like a, a, a little door where you go into the floor and it actually was a basement. And in the basement was all these. And this was like an A-list party. And it was very um, demonic, very dark. People were dressed very skimpy. It was it was a horrible situation as a Christian to look at. But you know, I was like, "What in the world? Where am I at?" And it was it was times like this when I I felt a heavy darkness, and I knew that there was more going on. And honestly, my mom, she was a Christian at this point, and she would write me words and these long letters. She put them under my door and send them to my house and. You know, I would read them reluctantly and I would pretend like I didn't, but she was speaking truth and saying the life that you're living is wrong. You're doing, you know, you're, you're in a, in a lifestyle of sin and you need to repent. And those words, as you mentioned earlier, they would resonate in my heart. And as I would go out and I would party and I would be around these people, you know, th this is like the dream. I mean, it, people in my high school thought I was living the life. I mean, you know, the people that were in my high school were like, wow, Todd's made it. Look what he's doing. Like, you know, it was cool. Yeah, you're made in the world. In yeah, the world, like to you're the made. world, it was cool. To the world, it mm. was cool to walk up to like some A-list club and be, you know, pulled forward in the line and wow, you made it, you know, and you're hanging out with these A-list people and all this stuff. You would think that that would be a fulfilling life because that's what the world says, you know, is this is you made it or whatnot, you know, you're making good money. But to me, I was so empty inside and lonely and broken. Mm. And, uh, you know, I felt this demonic stuff going on. I didn't know it was demonic, but I knew there was something dark. And that's what actually led me to seek the Lord, because I said, if there's darkness, there has to be light. And I remember going to church and I remember people speaking about Jesus to me. And actually, I didn't mention this, but when I was eight years old, somebody took me, my grandparents took me to a Billy Graham crusade. And I actually went wow. forward as an eight-year-old. Now, I didn't, you know, fully live for the Lord after that, but I never forgot that feeling, uh, you know, one of my mentors would always tells me, you know, when you taste the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, you never forget the taste. You never forget the Holy Spirit. And so, at, you know, when I was partying, I remembered as an eight-year-old that I had experienced God and, and I knew there was more. And so that caused me to, to seek. And the Bible says, when you seek, you'll find, you know, knock and the door shall be open. So that began my journey, Anna. That's amazing. I want to go back on some of the points you've mentioned. You know, I know some people personally as well that were in the Hollywood scene. One of them was a producer and a director. And, and then another one was an actor. And they told me about the same things that you were talking about. These parties, these A-list parties, some of them in the massive, massive mansion, beautiful yep. mansion. And one of the owners in the house had a downstairs bedroom is where he really lived and stayed. And one day, they were really close friends, uh, he went to do something and she was with her girlfriend and her girlfriend said, hey, let's go check out downstairs because this is such a beautiful house. How come he doesn't live up here? It must be nicer downstairs. Let's go downstairs. <laughs> and they went downstairs. It was like, she said she instantly felt the darkness. She was just like looking for the Lord at that time. She said she instantly felt such a demonic presence. It was such evil. She looked, she looked at the mattress. It was like, it was just a mattress. It was a nasty, dirty, filthy mattress, dirt everywhere. There were, you know, all types of things that people use in orgy parties and all that. It was so demonic. She said she ran out of there and she left that house and never talked to him again. Mm. She realized something was terribly wrong. How can you live in such a beautiful house, but be that messed up that you're living to, in something like that. It's a huge, you know, place where things are happening and she was all freaked out. Yeah. And so there's a facade of beauty and awesomeness, but in these deep A-list parties, there's really nefarious demonic things going on that if you people would know about it, they would be so grossed out. You would never watch their movies. You would never touch anything to do with it. 
and this is finding dangerous territory because I'm because I'm dangerous on YouTube. But you know, <laughs> things like that are out there. The casting couch is out there. There's there's nasty things out there. And so, but you're right about the other part where people would numb their pain with drinking and alcohol. And that's what I saw in the survivor world in the reality TV world world when I was invited to those parties. Everyone would come there and hang out, and I would find out that everyone was sleeping with one another. It wasn't like massive orgies like you see right. in Hollywood. But it was just people are married and it was drinking and there's drugs and, you know, there's I'm just like, I'm not about this life. I've never been. Right. And I'm very much like a homebody. So to me, it was like, ee, this is this is crazy. And, and, and I was an atheist. Thank God the Lord protected me from that. It's so interesting when when, you know, they lie and say, oh, Adam did this and that. I never kissed anyone in Survivor. How about that? Like, there's so many lies out there. So it's just crazy. But that's the thing. People numb themselves with drinking and alcohol. It's such a worldly success, but inside they're miserable. The survivor people, a lot of them are miserable. Right. The, the, the most famous reality stars, miserable. They don't know what to do with themselves. And, and they're trying to fill that void with, with alcohol and drugs. And it never, it never works. It's not the answer. The answer is what you were saying. The peace that surpasses all understanding, the presence of the Lord. Right. That's right. Wow. So- 100%. So what was that moment where you said, you know what, Jesus, you have me fully and completely. What was that like? You know, it's hard to say one moment because it was such a journey, but there were many times and I'll give you one that sticks out in my mind, but I was in Vegas and this was around the time. I don't know if you remember when the real world had the real world suite in Vegas. And so we were out in yeah. Vegas. This is a long time ago, kind of dating myself here, but um, you know, and, and we're, and we're sitting there and, and one of the people that were at, at the, one of these parties that you were talking about was probably the one of the biggest pop stars in the world. I'm not going to give her name, but you can probably guess. And she's sitting there and we're talking and she actually had taken an ecstasy. And so we're kind of in this, you know, hotel party and I'm talking and here I am little old me, you know, sitting in this party with all these A-list people and this, this person that's probably half, you know, the young people have like posters of her on their walls, you know, cause that was the big thing at the time. And I, Anna, she was so broken and wounded. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was like a big aha moment. Cause I said, here I am, what am I doing? Like, am I aspiring to be like her? Because, you know, I was a musician and a singer and an actor and I'm thinking, wow, she's all those things and, and more, you know, I mean, she's rich and famous and the whole world knows who she is. And here she is on drugs, broken as can be. And I'm like, do I want this? No. And that was really the defining moment for me where I said, this is not what I want out of my life. Okay, well, then what do you want out of your life? You know, and I started thinking about things that I really would want to serve the Lord, to be holy, you know, to be like you said, I mean, inside I was a good kid, you know, I was a good person. But unfortunately, because I didn't have Christ, I had gotten so off course. And I remember a saying, which really is a big one in my life. But if you pretend to be something long enough, one day you wake up and you are that person. And that's really what happened. You know, when I first started, it was all innocent and I would look at the big celebrities and I would kind of pretend, you know, and my ego and my pride was like, yeah, I want to be that. And, you know, all these different things. And so I pretended long enough. And one day I woke up and these were my friends. These were the people I was hanging around. And mm -hmm. then I realized, like you said, they're totally lost and broken and empty. And this isn't what I want out of my life. So then I knew that I had to make a change. So what did that change look like? So here's a cool thing. So my parents invited me to go to Hawaii and uh, it was just out of nowhere. And they said, you want to go to Hawaii? And, you know, I remember how old I was, like maybe 20 or something. But I said, yeah, you know, I'll go because who's going to say no to a free trip to Hawaii, right? Well, it turns out you it was for a Foursquare <laughs> convention. Uh, with Foursquare is like a Christian denomination, you know, and, uh, you know, they had a convention out there. So I go to this Foursquare convention and they said, the only thing is you have to attend some of the meetings, not all of them, just some of them. Okay, fine. The rest you of the time. You got the Holy Spirit, I can tell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Love so it. They, Holy Spirit set up. <laughs> <laughs> it was a total setup. And so, and, and so the thing is I'm out there and I'm thinking, you know what, uh, I'll go to a couple meetings and then I'll lounge on the beach, you know, and, and that'll be it, you know? And so I go to one of these meetings and there was a guy named Wayne Cadero that was speaking. He's a pastor out in Hawaii. And, you know, it was similar to, you know, you and I really like pastor Rodney Howard Brown, very similar type of message, you know, very anointed, very powerful. And it just touched me so much that I, I became sweaty and hot. And I was like, I have to get out of this room. So I, it was at this beautiful convention center right there in Honolulu. So I walk outside and no kidding. And it was like a beam of light came on me. I'm not even kidding you. And, and, you know, at the time I was living with my girlfriend in LA, you know, and so, you know, I'm, she stayed in LA, I'm, I'm by myself in Hawaii. And, and all of a sudden this beam of light comes on me in this beautiful Descanso garden out there. 
And I dropped to my knees and I think it was raining, but if it wasn't raining, it sure felt like it. Cause I felt like a mist and this light. And it was like, it was almost like a movie scene. And I dropped to my knees and I just, I, it was the presence of God and the Holy spirit that had drawn me to that very moment of my life where I had seen the darkness and I had been broken and I had been abused as a child and all these different things. But I knew that God was doing something right there in that moment. So I dropped to my knees and I said, God, I don't really know you. I have no idea how to follow you, but I know you're real. I can feel your presence and I want to serve you. And so it was that moment on that was the defining moment in my life. And the rest of the trip, I had pastors praying over me. And uh, I still talk to some of these guys today and, you know, speaking into my life. And I wish I could say that was the end, but it only gets crazier. I go back to LA. And so I, I you know, I, I had to move out of the house from, you know, living with my mm -hmm. girlfriend. So I moved back home. And that was kind of embarrassing for me to do, but I did. And so I'm back home with my parents. I start going to church on them and the church on the way. And, uh, you know, I'm going to church and, and then I get to church and here I am, this person that was hanging out with these celebrities in Hollywood and, you know, getting pulled up at the front of the line and Anna people at church, I could not make friends. It was like, I would walk in and stand there and no one would talk to me. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like, what is this? But I knew I had to change my life, but it took a season to start developing Christian friends. I thought that, you know, me going to church, like a lightning bolt was going to hit me. I really thought that was going to happen, but no, it didn't happen. But yeah, so it took some time to break through. And eventually I started working with the youth and uh, had this great pastor that was kind of mentoring me and he would meet me for lunch. And I will tell you, mentorship and discipleship is so incredibly important and key. And I think we're lacking that in the body of Christ today. But, you know, that was what got me out of that dark world. And this guy that would mentor me, this guy, Alex, he would just be completely blunt and say, Todd, you can't do that. You know, and we'd meet for lunch and I'd tell him what I'm up to. And he'd say, nope, no more of that in your life. No more of this in your life. And I'd be like, but Pastor Alex, that's, you know, that's like my favorite thing. No, you can't do that. And it was what I needed. And I respect him for it because he wasn't afraid. He wasn't trying to be cool in my eyes. He was trying to help me. And he got me out of that world. Now, here's the crazy thing about my testimony. So two years in, and I'm working with the youth and, you know, I've already given my heart to the Lord and I'm walking through a apartment complex in Granada Hills and a man that was on drugs and methamphetamine came out of an apartment building and stabbed me with a, with a kitchen knife nine times, one in the heart. And so I had already given my heart to the Lord. I got out of the world. You know, uh, it was probably some of my fault. I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. But the thing is, is, is that, so here I am stabbed on the ground two years into serving the Lord. What the heck is going on? And I look at the guy and I say, dude, I'm going to die. Like, you know, so, so what he did was he picked me up with his girlfriend and they put me in my car and they drive me to Granada Hills hospital, which by the way, this hospital was literally about to close in two weeks. They were going to shut it down. It's now a school, but thank God it was there. If it was not there, I would not have lived. So this man that stabbed me nine times, puts me in my own car, drives me to the hospital with this girl. I'm in the backseat bleeding. And on the way I felt uh, that I had died. I really knew that I was going to die. And I went into the presence of the Lord. And what happened was it was, it was just white. You know, my, my vision went to tunnel vision. All of a sudden I'm in this whiteness and I felt God say, do you want to live or do you want to die? And I said, Lord, I want to live. I feel like I have so much more in my life. He says, if you live, then you have to be on fire for me for the rest of your life. You got to be completely sold out. I said, okay, Lord. So when I said that I, I woke up and I'm in the emergency room with all these police and doctors and nurses around me. And they said, you should not be alive, son. You are only alive by God's grace. And I said, yes, absolutely. So that was a crazy experience. <laughs> stabbed <laughs> nine times and once in the heart. And the guy that stabbed you actually took you to the hospital. What? <laughs> if that's not the grace of the Lord and you survived it? Yes, wow. I survived. Now, there's a little bit more of the story. I, don't wanna, you know, I gotta so cool. check this out. So then, you know, I started. So here I am, this ex, you know, actor. I did some modeling, you know, and my body has all these stab wounds. And I'm looking at myself after I get out of intensive care and I go back home and I'm like, Lord, what the heck? Like now I'm serving you and this happens now, you know, why would you let this happen? So, so I started to get angry with God and was like, what, you know, why would this happen to me? I don't understand. I thought I had changed my life. And so I'm, you know, I finally go back to work and I'm at the Burbank Macy's cause I was working at Macy's at the time. And the, the, you know, anybody that knows California and Burbank and Glendale, there's a lot of Armenian people in that area. It's known as like the highly, most highly penetrated Armenian community and Armenians are Christians most of them. So this woman, this little old lady, uh, I think she's an Armenian lady comes up and she says, the Lord showed me your face. I was shopping in the woman's department and she said to come and give you a word. 
okay, what's the word? She says, don't let bitterness grow root in your heart. The Lord knows what you just did, but he's going to continue to, you know, uh, show himself in your life and you're going to have a powerful testimony and just stay focused on the Lord and don't give up. And so everybody that's standing there with me starts bawling because we're all, everybody knew that what I had just been through with the people that work with me wow. and they're bawling, we're all bawling. And so I was like, wow, that's crazy. Two days later, I go back to the gym because I'm, I'm really uh, motivated to get back in and, you know, overcome that I had just been stabbed. So, you know, I go back to the gym and I'm at the gym and I'm looking at this guy and he's all tattooed up, you know, and big guy and all tattooed up. And I'm kind of thinking about his tattoos and, and he turns around, Anna, and he points his finger at me and he says, I have a word for you. I'm like, what? I'm at the gym. He has a word for me. What's the word? The Lord is stalking you. He's not <laughs> letting you go. He's, he's like, hello, I'm talking this to you. This is wild. I mean, think about it. I, you know, we're talking about being an atheist. You know, how am I, how am I going to explain this stuff? I mean, you can't. there's the, no way I'm not in a church. My mom didn't put these people up to it. Yep. Something is happening. Not so a guy, coincidence. <laughs> Come on. This is, this is over and over and over again. Come on. It's insane. So the guy starts telling me, he says, you know, you're going to soar like, you know, wings of an eagles and you're going to run and not grow weary and starts prophesying over me for like 10 minutes. And people are just all looking and everybody's like, wow, what's going on? And so I leave there just in shock. I couldn't work out after that. So I just leave in shock and I'm like, wow, God, you're really getting my attention here. You know, third time I'm at a Starbucks. I don't go to Starbucks now, by the way, but I'm at a Starbucks at the time and I'm sitting there just enjoying a latte or whatever. And some person walks up to me, says, I have a word for you. You know, God is with you and he's going to use you and anoint you and you're going to be a pastor and all this stuff. So this is the third time in less than a month that a random stranger came up to me after my stabbing and gave me a similar word that confirmed. And the Bible says in the mouth of two or more witnesses, my word shall be established. So here's three. Uh, so that's more than two. And they're telling me I'm going to be a pastor. They're telling me I'm called. They're telling me there's an anointing. And they're telling me not to grow weary, not to be bitter. So at that point, I'm just like, okay, God, clearly you're real. I'm going to serve you. I'm not mad at you. Let's go. And so I enrolled in the King's College and Seminary and went to Bible college. And the rest is really history. I mean, it's a very short version of a long story, but... <laughs> That's incredible. So, and you've been a pastor for over 10 years now. Yeah. No, I've been a, a pastor wow. for almost 17 years. Yeah. 17. And only in my early forties, but um, yeah. So, you know, God, uh, after that, I became a pastor. I started in youth ministry Then I worked in college ministry Then I was an associate pastor and then I became uh, a pastor uh, of a church. And so, uh, you know, out in LA, we did all types of Bible studies and you know, different things with Hollywood people. So God redeemed what I had come from, which was that world and brought me back. And I was kind of scared. Anna, when I first went back, cause I'm like, wow, this is a little bit scary. I'm going back to Hollywood. And he gave me, so here's another crazy story. If anybody doesn't believe that God is real, these things should convince you. I'm, I'm in a prayer circle and some guy looks at me and he says, I feel like you're meant to be the host of this show on KKLA. I said, well, I've never done radio before. You know, he said, no, no, I really feel like you're the guy. And so he was the producer of a show called Hollywood Alive Radio, and he he had a thick accent, so he couldn't be the, the host, and he felt that God had said that I'm the man for the job. So I said, well, I'll pray about it. I prayed about it. God said, yes, uh, this is 2011. And then for many years, I hosted Hollywood Alive Radio, where we interviewed people about what God is up to in Hollywood. And then here's the kicker. I started studying Hollywood from a spiritual perspective. And I went back in there as a Christian. I went back in there redeemed. God restored what the enemy tried to steal from my life. God restored it and redeemed it. And I really believe I flipped teams. So if you're on a sports team and you know all the other teams plays, what's going to happen? You're going to win because you already know their playbook. So I came from the world. I partied. I came from darkness in Hollywood. I was an atheist. I go back to Hollywood as a spirit-filled, on-fire believer that's anointed and appointed and knows the word of God. And my goodness, Anna, it was amazing what God has done over the years in allowing us, you know, opening doors that only he could open to mentor certain people, to speak into their life, to give prophetic words, to teach people. And, uh, and then Hollywood led to government because what happened is when I started studying what was going on in Hollywood and the spiritual dynamics and what I saw from the casting couch, child sex trafficking, all different things that people don't like to talk about, but that I witnessed firsthand. 
And these are very dark things. But as a, as a person of faith that has studied the word of God, now I understand the spiritual dynamic because the Bible says the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against strongholds and principalities. So now understanding that I'm going back into Hollywood and, and, and going against this, you know, the strongholds of the principalities, but the, the Lord has given us authority to trample on the scorpions and to cast out and to, and to bind and to loose. And so going back into Hollywood with that in mind, it's amazing the understanding yeah. and that led to government because government was influencing Hollywood. And so that's what leads me to where I am today is because I realized that most of what's going on in Hollywood, there's like what they call a plumb line to Washington, D.C. and to government. And they're very closely related. And uh, it, it's interesting, but there's actually more connection than most people understand when it comes to the movies that are made, the content that they're putting out there. There's a lot of propaganda, a lot of messaging. And that's all being established from Hollywood and the mm -hmm. people that are running the, the, you know, what I call the deep state. But, you know, the people behind or the shadow government or whatever in, in, in D.C. are connected to Hollywood. It's so true. And to the media as well. We know yes. that, too. Um, so you started something that was really amazing. You started something called the Religious Liberty Coalition. Yes. Tell us about that, because this yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. So this is just one of my passions, uh, you know, in the, in the last year or so, and, and, you know, it's again, a short version, very long story, but you know, there's been pastors that have been arrested. There's been churches that have been, uh, shut down. And unfortunately there's, you know, this is persecution. And I believe we were only seeing the beginning. If we look at what's happening at our neighbor to the North, uh, you know, in Canada, there's some very egregious things that are happening there. Um, I have friends in Victoria in, in, in Australia, and they're telling me of stories out there that are unbelievable friends in the UK. So it's a lot of Western countries where we're seeing this, but there is uh, definitely an attack on religious liberty and freedom in many different aspects. And so we felt there was a void and a need. Uh, and we have a coalition of lawyers that are willing to stand with churches and parachurch ministries and people of faith. If you're a Christian business owner, you can be part of the religious liberty coalition. You can join. And what happens is if you come under attack, we will step in and defend you. And we will stand with you. And so you don't have to pay legal fees. You don't have to worry. And listen, we're itching to take some of these things to the Supreme Court because I'm a big constitutional person. I love the Constitution. And, you know, the First Amendment is the right to assemble. We have the right to gather, to speak freely, to speak about our faith. The government is, is meant to be out of our faith. In fact, a lot of people talk about separation of church and state. But let me just go there real quick. That's actually a letter to the Danbury Baptist Church that was yeah. promising that government would stay out of the church, not that church would stay out of the government. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of infringement on our rights. I have pastors, Anna, that are calling me and telling me their Facebook page has been taken down. I said, well, pastor, what did you post? Well, we posted scriptures. This is scary. And this should not be happening in the United States of America where the law of the land is the Constitution. And by the way, our founders were believers. They used to pray. They used to talk about the word of God and their faith openly. In fact, there was a Bible called the Aiken Bible, which was the first approved Bible of the Congress and, uh, you know, printed here in the United States after the Revolutionary War. And this this was approved text that was used in the Congress. And so these people were believers and they believed in something called inalienable rights. And the inalienable rights are the, the, the rights of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And, you know, we stand for life and we stand for freedom. And so that's what we're doing at the Religious Liberty Coalition. We want to give you, uh, you know, a big brother, if you will, somebody that's willing to stand with you, defend you, protect you, and uh, against these infringements on our religious liberties. That's wonderful that you're doing that. So if anyone is a pastor and they're being told to shut down for you know what reason, I can't say it on YouTube, because then they're watching me like a hawk. But how can they reach out to you if they need help, if they know a pastor who's struggling and they want to open the church and they're afraid of the legal ramifications that they're going to deal with, which is yep. ridiculous because it's part of your First Amendment, right? Yep. Um, how can they reach out to you to find out more information about this? Absolutely. So, you know, you heard a little bit about my testimony today, but this is a huge passion in my life. And it's because we have to defend the church is the backbone to this nation. Uh, the church in the body of Christ, if, if we change, if we repent, if we turn back to our first love, Jesus Christ, we will lead the nation. The Bible says to be the head and not the tail. And so it's very powerful when the church is, is, is aligned with the will of God. And, and the will of God is to be open. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling together of the brethren. It also says, lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. 
And so we believe that, if, you know, in, in the name of Jesus and by the power and authority of the Holy Spirit, we are able to lay hands on the sick. I've seen it so many times, uh, miracle signs and wonders. God is still in the miracle work and business. You heard my testimony. He's still doing that. And so we have to be uh, open and protected. And so if they want to reach out to me, they can email me at Todd, T-O-D-D dot C-O-C-O N-A-T-O, just my name at rlcus.org. That's Religious Liberty Coalition. Dot org rlcus.org and i would be happy to help you in any way i can amen i will have his email down below in the description box but todd how else can people follow you and i'm gonna have all your links down there but just what's the best way to reach you so it's your email and what else what's yeah the best media? way is just to go to my website toddcoconado.com very simple and that's kind of like the central hub we have something called remnant news uh which we started when we did hollywood live radio and then we went into the remnant news and we're basically just giving uh news from my biblical worldview and have several amazing contributors that are on fire for the Lord that write each day. And so you can go to rmntnews.com, toddcoconado.com, and you can see everything that we're doing there, including the Religious Liberty Coalition. Fantastic. Well, praise God. Thank you, Pastor Todd Coconado, for joining us. You're going to have to come back. This was really, really fun. You're, you're anytime, awesome. anytime. I mean, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're all out here doing the same mission to, yeah. to set the captive free and wake up people. And Anna, we just appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate what you do, what you're doing. And I love how you went from Hollywood atheist to Jesus to back to Hollywood to preach Jesus. And now you're going into government and, and preaching to the people in government as well. It's so beautiful. I love when people are so passionate about the Lord and his mission, which is freedom, liberty, um, set the captives free, you know, yeah. heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. So cool. You are really an inspiration. So I bless you. I thank you for coming on and I will see you soon. Are you going to Tampa, by the way? Yeah, I will definitely be in Tampa. I wouldn't miss that for anything. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, uh, I went from being an addicted person to literally getting to lay hands on a president of the United States. It's pretty amazing what God has done in my life. And he'll do the same for you. Hallelujah. He'll change us and set us free and give us joy. And I mentioned about a void earlier. Jesus is the ultimate void filler. That's right. Amen. Well, Pastor, would you want to just say a quick prayer before we go? I would love to. So, Lord, we just thank you so much for this time. And I thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about my journey. And I believe every person listening has a journey. And, Lord, it may be a little bit different. There may be some similarities. But we're all seeking, Lord, to, to find that peace and that joy and happiness. And uh, it's even something that I mentioned in the inalienable rights, the pursuit of happiness. Well, the pursuit of happiness leads us to Jesus Christ, to you, Lord. Which, which fills our heart with joy and peace that passes understanding and changes our life. You say that you give us life and life more abundantly. And so I just pray for each and every person listening that no matter where they are in their life right now, we're not here to judge or condemn them, but we want to just offer hope. You say that you give us hope and a future. Your promise is yes and amen. No matter what's going on in the world, we can find refuge and peace and safety and protection and all these things in you. So I just pray that each and every person listening would be blessed and find favor with you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. In Jesus name. Amen. And if anyone does not know Jesus, if you have, if you're an atheist watching this right now and you, you watch the whole way through and you feel something in your heart, tugging you, tugging you, you want to know Jesus. You, you were radically moved by what Todd just shared with you. Just ask the Lord Jesus. Yes. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're real. I don't want to go to hell. I, I've seen the demonic around me in whatever circle I'm in. It may not be Hollywood. It may be in your workplace. It may be in your, you know, your coach and you see what's going on around you and there's pedophiles everywhere, you know, whatever it may be. You just say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're real. Yes. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to walk with you every single day of my life. I completely lay down my life and follow you. And he is so gracious enough. It doesn't matter what you did. That's right. He doesn't care. It's in the past. It's over. He doesn't judge you. He doesn't say, actually, wait, let's go through all of your sins. You did this, you did that, you did that. You did. No, our God is so awesome. He says, my son, my daughter. You are free. You are clean. Your sins are forgiven. It says in the Bible that love remembers no wrongs. He doesn't remember anything anymore. It's under the blood of Jesus. You are a new creation. I'm telling you, 
you know, the Bible says don't test the Lord, but in some places it says, you know, you can when you tithe and things like that. Test the Lord. See what he's going to do in your life when you just trust him. You've trusted yourself for so long. You've trusted the world for so long. You've believed all the you are successful. You're going to be happy line that they say in the world. No, you've trusted yourself. Trust Jesus who's real. Listen, you're talking to two used to be atheists who were radically saved, had encounters with the Lord. Todd almost died, had an encounter with God. Yeah. I was at the Western Wall blaspheming God, saying, look at these idiots praying to a God that doesn't exist. And the Lord opened up the heavens on top of my head. And it was amazing. The glory of the Lord fell. I heard angels singing. Incredible. Let me tell you, two atheists who are now radically on fire for Jesus. Heaven is real. The Lord showed me hell in a dream. This is all real. So if you trust in the Lord, ask him to forgive you of your sins, follow him, read the Bible, you know, start with Matthew, read the first gospel and go through and you will see your life. You will see the fruit in your life. Bear such beautiful fruit, peace, joy, happiness. You're going to be fulfilled and satisfied. God is so good and he loves you. And, and Todd, you want to jump in and say anything else? No, I mean, it's exactly right. You know, he, like I mentioned earlier, he's the ultimate void filler. And, you know, no matter what you've been through in your life, I thought, you know, like I'd mentioned that I'd go into church and a lightning bolt would strike me, but God, he hasn't come for the perfect person. He's come for the sinner and uh, he wants us to be saved and set free and healed and delivered. And the Bible says who the sun sets free is free. Indeed. Many people spoke so many things. You'll never make it. You're going to fail this and that over my life. And if I would have let those take root, that would be my identity. But what I was able to do through the power of the Holy Spirit is find my identity in Jesus Christ. And he's taken me from glory to glory. There's no way that I could have done the things that God has. I mean, only by the grace of God, he opens doors. He guides my path. And the thing is, people say, well, what, what do you have? And I say, it's Jesus and you can have him too. It's, it's, it's the most amazing thing. Accept him in your heart today. It'll be the biggest decision you've ever made in your life. Nothing will ever be the same. And as Anna had mentioned, and I, I will concur, is, is that when you, even if you just give God a try, once you, you know, just say, Lord, I want to experience you, you know, uh, show yourself to me. I guarantee you, you will have an experience with God. Anybody that's ever come to me uh, that's asked that question and has actually done it has an encounter with the Lord. And that's what we desire. Have an encounter with God today. It will change your life. Here's the last thing I'll say, Anna. There's a lot of people that believe we came from a big bang. And I always say there's a lot of holes in that story. You have more faith than I do because where did the big bang come from? You know, it had to come from somewhere and we have to acknowledge that there's a higher being. And mm. if there is that higher being, which we know there is, then surely it's the God of heaven and earth. And it takes less faith to believe that he created all things and he's alive and he wants to heal your life and set you free.